Good morning. Miss Standard, how are you? Hope to, glad to see you here, Rhonda. <clears throat> we'll give everybody a couple minutes to get logged on. Good morning, Miss Jan and her our beautiful artist. Doing some pretty drawings and posting them. Keep that up. We're all enjoying that very much. And the scriptures, what a great way to minister. Good morning, Susan. <clears throat> Hope everybody had a happy 4th of July, or still having a happy 4th of July weekend. Been good at the McFarland house. Family time. I see Kathy, Cheryl, Chris Rogers, Stacy. Good to see y'all logged in. Give everybody just a moment. For those of you that were with us in Sunday school class, I know that I know that everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. That was a good Sunday school lesson. Miss Naomi, good to see you. I was on Facebook just a second ago and I saw Naomi watching. It looked like you were watching or commenting on Wednesday night's teaching, so I was concerned Naomi wouldn't make it. I see Joe Dempsey. I see Kathy. I see Betty Standard. Good. There's Stan Morris and Shirley. Good to see y'all logged in. Praying y'all are doing well. Having a good 4th of July weekend. So, uh, it's been a, it's been a, Yet another uh, trying couple of weeks for us to be on Facebook Live. I know some of you that hadn't been able to attend services in the building with us. Not much has changed there other than the background behind me when I when I teach and uh, you're not able to be part of the live worship, but you get to see that posted uh, on a separate post by uh, Naomi and Stacy and even Joshua. So that was awesome. Good to see. Good to see that. And we appreciate Joshua's great performance, and Naomi always does an amazing job. Um, so, just a couple of more minutes. I'm seeing 11:01 on my clock, so I'm giving everybody a a couple of more minutes for people to log in. Uh, right now, we're going to continue to play things week by week. Hopefully, I mean, it, it looks like every time we turn around, the news keeps saying there's more cases, and there's a, yet another reason for us to. To, um, to isolate and, and, and uh, be cautious. So, you know, I don't, I don't see a trend moving in a positive direction in that way yet, but we're still playing things um, on a weekly basis. Um, good morning, Lisa. We see you. Charlene and, and Charlie, we see y'all, Bina. So, um, but anyways, uh, so in the meantime, we're playing things on a week by, by week basis. We'll see how things go. Uh, as we as we plug along, but thank God we get to do this. I'm anxious, always anxious to be back in the sanctuary as most of you are, and prayerfully we'll get to do that again soon. Um, <clears throat> I see David Tristan. Good morning, David, Patty. But uh, anyways, <clears throat> you know, there's um, as Christians we uh, we have so many things that we need to remember, and uh, it, it, the important thing about our journey is to remember a couple things at the very forefront, and that is that we are on a journey. Um, each individual, we're all on an individual journey. And so when we're on that individual journey, um, our focus needs to be on our walk with the Lord, period. Now, what happens then is as we focus on our walk with the Lord, uh, a lot of other things, topics come up and a lot of other things to think about come up. And when we focus on our walk with the Lord, the way we interpret life changes. And uh, so we're going to kind of talk about that today. <laughs> we're going to talk about um, what scriptures teach us on our focus as we walk with the Lord. And, and we're going we're to kind of talk about why people do the things that they do. This is an age-old question. Psychology has tried to answer it uh, a lot of time, a lot of different ways over the years. And uh, in, in doing that, they've examined personality, which I'm fascinated by. They have examined um, uh, development, human development, which I'm also fascinated by. And I've even put together my own uh, biblical psychology model of, of human development. Um, so psychology and, and sociology and all of those scientific fields have tried to figure out why people do the things they do. Um, there are many who, who in, in fact, I'm fascinated by watching. I've read books on it. 
on the mind of, of serial killers and what makes them, what triggers them and what makes them make the decisions they make and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's fascinating the way the, 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 phys the physiology of the brain and the way the chemistry works and, and has a lot to do with emotion and, and guilt and all those kind of things. But when we go to the Bible, we can find out why people do the things that they do. And it's, it's in, in a nutshell, it's divided up. There's always a basis. There's always some kind of foundation when you're, when you're, when you're drawing conclusions. And when we're going to draw conclusions about the decisions that we make as individuals, we need a basis. We need some kind of foundation. Otherwise, we're just reaching in a lot of different directions. So today, we're going to go to the book of Ephesians. If you'll go there with me, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. And um, all we've done so far, for those of you who've just log been able to log in, just find us. We, we've just kind of given an introduction. We're glad you're, you're logged in, everyone. Uh, but we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> And uh, we're going to start in verse 17, Ephesians 4, verse 17. I tell you what, let's go to verse 27 first. Got to change things. Always have to change things. That's just my nature. That's uh, okay. You could ask, why do you do things the way you do, right? Uh, I always like, you know, you folks know, I always like to look at where we're going. I always like to look at where we're headed because then the path makes a lot more sense. Ephesians 4, 27 is our beginning verse. And Paul is talking to Christians, obviously. He's telling Christians, uh, Gentiles in particular, these Gentile Christians that had no law in the past, they had no uh, uh, biblical, it would be a word we would use today, but in their case, they, they had no uh, religious foundation prior to this. So they weren't raised like the Jews. They weren't raised with the law. They weren't raised going to the temple. They weren't raised practicing the sacrifices and things like that. But now we have these Christians, these Gentiles at Ephesus, and Paul is addressing them. And when he addresses them, he's, he's letting them see directly. The Old Testament gave some physical examples that were a foreshadow. The shadow before the truth came, and it was pointing the Jews to the truth. Well, the Gentiles didn't have that. And in Ephesians, you can see Paul just kind of dives into uh, directly the spiritual side of things, which the Old Testament was, was in place to reveal the spiritual side of things. So when, when Paul's going to address Gentiles, and when we talk to Gentile believers uh, today, and you and I as Gentiles, we understand that uh, everything is spiritual. It's the spirit of man that determines uh, his spirit, his heart, his will that determines so many things in his life. And you're going to see in our study today that it is our will uh, that determines the choices that we make in life. Um, and we're seeing that in society. And, and you can tell a lot about a person by the way they talk, the, the, the decisions they make. You can see priorities in a person's life. Now, obviously, one quick decision isn't a good way to judge that. In fact, the Bible tells me not to be a judge. So when it tells me not to be a judge, that's what it's referring to. Don't judge the will. Don't judge the heart. Don't judge the salvation. But we can always judge the behavior, the, the choice. But one choice is not a good determine, determining factor as to where a person's will or heart is because all of us make choices sometimes that are outside of what we as Christians should be doing or, or the choices we should be making. But what he does tell, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.27, he tells us, nor give place to the devil. The devil is not a mythical figure. He's not a, a red cartoon character with a pitchfork and, and horns. Uh, in fact, the Bible talks about the devil and, and what he is. Cartoon books and, and, and uh, comic books and, and, you know, have made light of, of who Satan is, but he is very real. He's very powerful. He is very active. He's an angel. So he's an angelic being who has made a decision uh, to revolt against God. So this angel has brought with him, according to scripture, one third of all angels ever created. So he's got a vast array of fallen angels working with him. Now, how many are there? We don't know. The Bible just says an innumerable amount of angels were created. So God's saying there's a lot, and that's what you need to know. Now, 
we, we live in a world, and Paul gets into it later in the book, that is very spiritual. Things that happen are very spiritual. He says our, the weapons of our warfare are not physical, but they're mighty through God. So to win warfare in life, and, and, and I'm introducing, when we talk about don't give the devil place, you're, you're going to see how this plugs together. So don't give spiritual opposition. Uh, don't give Satan a place in our life to draw us away. And what he's wanting us to see here and what he's telling this church is things that are happening are spiritual. They're coming from within. And as those things come from within, it's important that we're aware of how just as well as the spirit of God is inside of us, Satan is not inside of us. So we need to be careful not to give him a place on the inside of us. Now, that's that's a simple point, and it's it's a general thought and a principle. And what, what he's telling us is Christians obviously cannot be possessed by Satan, but we can be influenced. And what does he want to influence? He wants to influence my will. He wants to influence my passion, my desire. He wants to influence the way we think. And the Bible talks a whole lot about that. The way we think think comes from our will, our passion, our desire, our purpose. So Paul says, don't give place to the devil. Let's back up, if you will, to verse 17. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of of their minds. Now, what he's telling us here is a couple things. First of all, I want us to, to pull some simple principles from it, though, and then we'll, we'll probably land back there in a little while. But what he tells us is, <clears throat> first of all, there's a difference between the, the, the new Christian, the new Gentile, the Gentile that's been born again, and who they were as a Gentile prior to. So there's a separation here. The Jews were not so much walking in the futility, the way it's used here of their minds. They were walking in the religiosity of their minds. The things that the Jews were doing, they were doing because they were religious. This is what they always did. This is what they thought they were supposed to do. Um, this is what God wants us to do. So their decisions were based on some kind of religious idea. On the other hand, people who never had the truth, people who did not know the law of God, people that didn't know the word of God, they were living according to the futility of their mind. It's futile, it's foolish, it's vain. Uh, and we'll talk about that. He's telling Gentile Christians, no longer walk in the futility, no longer walk in the vanity of your mind. In fact, Solomon tells us that uh, all the ways of man are right in his own eyes. So uh, we make the decisions we make because we think they're right. Um, it, we may not put a lot of thought into it, but the other night we talked about in our study, we talked about being very prudent. In other words, making decisions with the future in mind, not now. Now and, and, and the, the right at this moment should not take precedence. It should not be more important than what this will produce in the future, like the farmer plows his field and plants the seeds and the crops. But he says that Gentiles should not no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles. So the implication is we've all done it. All right. So the implication is as the rest, we used to do it too. No longer do that. Um, so my old ways should not be um, the way that I continue to live today. There should be a difference. There should be a separation. He's telling the church, he's telling me and you, which are Gentiles studying this, He's saying, you weren't raised up like the Jews were. You weren't raised up with all of these religious ideas. Now, many of us were raised in the Bible and in church and taught things. But he's saying, don't do what you see common man doing. Don't do what you see happening around you. So for starters, why do people do the things they do? Well, they're doing it because they're doing what everybody else is doing. This is pretty common. It's pretty normal. Uh, you can get people... It, it, you don't get a crowd all of a sudden to start doing something because the crowd all of a sudden all makes the same decision without communication. Uh, a group may start doing it, then somebody else may join them, somebody else may join them. And it may start with a small group, it may start with an idea, but it starts to have an influence and then other people start to follow. He's telling us to be careful about that. The easiest thing to do is not, not put any thought into our decisions and just kind of follow haphazardly, just walk through life in the futility, the vanity of our minds. In other words, don't make decisions without a purpose. That would be a vain decision. 
we always have a reason for what we do, okay? We always have a reason for what we do. We may not acknowledge the reason, um, but we have a reason because we feel like doing it. We didn't feel like doing it. Uh, we thought it'd be fun. We thought it'd be entertaining. We thought we might get attention. We thought we might get something we want. There's always an, an underlying reason for the decisions that we make, whether we acknowledge those or not. In verse 17, he says, uh, no longer walk, live, have a lifestyle <clears throat> as the rest of the Gentiles walk or their lifestyle and their lifestyle is futile. It's vain. So the things that they do um, are, are pointless. In fact, they're quite self-willed. Our focus this year, the, this, the verse that I gave us this year is, is, is we, we, for a church is in Proverbs 28, 19. And that verse says, where there is no vision, people perish. In other words, imagine where there is no insight. Okay, And we think about vision meaning uh, plans, agenda, goals, dreams, that's not the term used here. It means if you can't see, if you're in the dark, you perish. So where there is no vision, if you're blind, spiritually blind, then you're perishing. All right. So we're being told when we connect scripture to scripture that we need to have a purpose and that we need to see life and that we need to make decisions based on the light and not based on futility or not based on vanity. Let's go to verse 18 and let's kind of look at um, the causes. Let's look at some of the things that he breaks down in this, in this text. Why people make self-willed, uh, futile, vain decisions. He talks about it. When we look at what's going on in society, the arguing, the fighting, the, 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 um, the foolishness, um, the, the debates over things, everybody's pushing an agenda for something they want. Uh, we're, we're, we're all take, we all take part of that in, in some regard. We just need to be careful and not get into vain arguments, not get into foolish arguments. We all have an agenda. We all want something. So Paul's telling us, make sure that you, that you buy into, that you marry God's agenda for your life and that the purpose for your decisions are based on that and they're not based on what's happening around you. Verse 18 says, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. I'll stop with the end of verse 18. Verse 18, he tells us a whole lot of information. So he, he says, because of, because of, because of. So what he's telling us is this causes this, which causes this, which causes this. So when he said in verse, they walk in the futility of their mind, verse 17, he's saying, here's why they do that. So it's my job, it's your job today to think about when you and I make a decision that is futile or vain, here's how we get to that point, okay? This is how vain decisions are made. This is how, it, how we reach that spot. It also gives me some understanding and some compassion because when Jesus looked at the multitudes, it says that he was moved with compassion, and it tells us why. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they didn't have anyone to follow. They didn't have that one who had the, the better insight. They were like sheep in a group of people who just followed other sheep, and those other sheep can't see any better than they can, so you're now no better off than you were before. But the shepherd stands taller, the shepherd is much wiser, the shepherd has the rod, the shepherd has the staff, the shepherd has the best interest of the sheep in mind. So a sheep needs a shepherd to follow, not a group of sheep to follow. Now, he, it, the sheep join the, together, but they don't follow another sheep, they follow the shepherd. And you and I are sheep and we follow Christ. You don't follow me and, and we follow Christ. And although God may speak through me or to our, through our teachers, it's Christ that we follow and it's important that we do that. But back to the point here in verse 18, he says, here's why, verse 17, they walk in the futility, the vanity of their minds. Here's why they do it. Okay, their condition, verse 18, they, their understanding's darkened. They have bad condition. Now, why is their understanding darkened? Because they're alienated from the life of God. Why are they alienated from the life of God? Because of the ignorance that's in them. Why are they ignorant, verse 18, because of the blindness of their hearts. So he tells us several things in this verse 
One causes the other that causes the other that causes the other. Now, <clears throat> we're going to do this backwards, as you probably assumed that we would. <coughs> Excuse me. He says in verse 18, the very last part, because of the blindness of their heart. All right, so these are people who, who cannot see. They're blind. They're in the dark. Now, it says the blindness of their heart. So this word is porosis, porosis in Greek. And that word means covering with a callus. It means no mental discernment. It means to have dulled perception. But it also means you're stubborn. So why do we do the things we do? Why do the Gentiles, why does the lost man, okay? When we talk about, you may hear somebody say the total, they believe in the total depravity of mankind. I believe in the depravity of mankind. What does that mean? When Adam and Eve fell from, uh, from fellowship with God, they were without hope. They now saw things through their own eyes and they had their own goal and their own agenda and their own plans and their own dreams and they, they had their own perspective. Everybody since then was born separate from God. Now, the Bible says no man seeks after God. We, we are totally separated, and on our own, we are uh, helpless and hopeless. That's the total depravity of man. We would not on our own figure out how to, to draw near to God, how to have a relationship with God. On our own, we can't figure that out. We're without hope. We're stuck, okay? The biblical word is we're dead. Now, a dead man is helpless and hopeless without divine intervention. Spiritually, we're helpless and hopeless without divine intervention. Now, the good news is, and this is where I steer, uh, this is where I part ways with some that'll teach, where they say when they have, they believe in the total depravity of man, they believe then that you can only get saved if you're picked to get saved. And if you weren't picked to get saved, you won't get saved. Okay, this is where I steer away from them because, and the reason I do, the writer of Hebrews says the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it is able to divide the soul and the spirit. The word of God has the power, and God has given us that power. He's given us his word. So even though we are totally, we are totally de depraved from God, we're separated, we're dead men, that doesn't mean that, um, that nobody can be saved unless God says, hey, you come here. No, God is calling all men to be saved, and he's given us the word of God that has the ability to lead us to salvation, to enlighten us and bring us to the truth. Back on focus. It tells us here that the very reason that these people are, are living uh, in the vanity of their own minds. The reason we make decisions before we were saved, the reason we made the decisions we made is because our hearts were calloused, we were blind, we did not have better discernment, and uh, in fact, our thoughts and our feelings um, were, were, we were stubborn. We had our own ideas. Where'd we get them from? Other sheep, right? Or in that case, other goats. So we just adopted philosophy. So we adopted ideas, society. A person goes out into society and listens to this and listens to that and says, well, I like that, I like that. Now, why would they do that? Because they find a way for it to benefit them. So we look for things that we think will benefit us and therefore that's what we follow. Paul went on Mars Hill in the book of Acts and he saw these, all these idols set up to 17 different uh, gods, if you will, and there was one even to an unknown God. And these philosophers spoke and they taught. And whoever had the newest and strongest philosophy, um, people tended to, to gravitate towards that person and follow them because they found a way for that to, they found benefit in it. He said, your heart's blind, all right? Your, your, um, your appetite, what you want. So why do we do the things we, we do? because it makes the most sense to us. It makes sense to us. We find benefit in it, and our hearts callous to see anything different once we find that benefit. So let's just use that thought and rethink about verse 17. He says, don't no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, meaning people that are not saved, in the vanity of their minds, 
because of the blindness of their hearts. They're doing this because they can't see anything different. This is all they can see. It's all they can imagine. If you don't know there's a God, you live for the world. If you, okay, I believe there's a God, but that's where it ends, and you think that this life I do what I want, and then the next life I worry about there being a God. If that's your mindset, and it is the mindset of some people, then you're still going to live according to the ways you want. It's still futile, and you're still blind and calloused. So he said that we will make bad decisions. We will make a decision to live our own life if our hearts are blind, all right? Now, this is our will, our motive, our intentions. If, we, if we're in the dark, if all we can see is with our physical eyes, then our decisions are going to look one way. No wonder people are going to try to find a, a, a king or a political leader. The, gen, the Jews looked for a king to rule over them, to give them hope. Here, let's let somebody else worry about this. God, give us a king. Let's let somebody else worry about making the hard decision so I'm just going with my life. That was their mindset. That's going on today. People are saying, it's the government's job. Let's just get a, a new president. He'll fix everything. That way I don't have to worry about it. Let's just get somebody to give me what I need, what I want. Life will be easy, and then I can go do what I want to do. Because we don't want to take responsibility for our choices. We want to put that responsibility on somebody else. But there's danger in doing that, and it's futile. If we put all of our trust, all of our hope in another man, we can never get any more. We can never get any further uh, spiritually than that person can lead us. And they're just another sheep without a shepherd. They're another goat. They're, they're, they're in need. In fact, they too have a blind heart. Let's go back to verse 18. So they have their understanding darkened. They're alienated. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. So this is the next thing to focus on. It says, um, the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So their heart is blind. They can't see past it. We got that part. Now, what does that do? That creates ignorance. So if all I know, if all we know is what we can dream up, if what we can imagine or another person can tell us, then we're going to be very ignorant. That means unlearned. The word means it's uh, ignoia, okay? Ignoia, it's an easy one to remember. It's the lack of knowledge, especially of divine things, of divine things. It's a lack of knowledge of divine things, and it is moral blindness. So if we don't have God's morals, we're going to create our own. We're going to say, well, this is right and wrong. This is right and wrong. Well, you know what? More people are wanting to do that, so let's not make that wrong anymore. Let's say that's okay. And let's find a reason to adapt so that we can all just get along. Well, that's a, that's a very, very steep and slippery slope when you start doing that, but we see it happening today. But the reason that the... Uh, that it says their heart is blind, and what does that what, what does that cause? That, that causes ignorance. So you don't know any better. If your heart's calloused, if you got your own idea, if you in fact you're stubborn and you don't want to know anymore, and we live in a very stubborn society today. Unfortunately, we even have many stubborn Christians. We get the idea that we know the Bible because we know the stories. We get the idea that we know the Word of God because we've heard a sermon on something before. But that don't mean we aren't ignorant. That means we're familiar. It doesn't mean we're wise. So there's too many people that are familiar with the Word of God, but don't know the Word of God. We're familiar with the story, but we haven't heard God speak to us. Don't know the voice of God from, from a, a foghorn, but we think that we are a Christian. It's important that we're, not, um, that we're not ignorant, okay? We need to know the Word of God. I pound this probably in every sermon I, I preach, because if we don't know the Word of God, then how are we going to make decisions that are best for us? How are we going to make decisions that glorify God? How are we going to see other people the way God sees them? How are we going to see our future? How are we going to hear the voice of God, know his voice? How are we going to in any way go through life with our eyes open? We aren't. So he's telling, Paul's telling us that they, they're blind in their heart. Now that causes ignorance, okay? That means that causes ignorance. That means that they don't know. If our heart is in a bad position, that is our will, then our thinking is going to follow that. 
So why do people do the things they do? Because the condition of their heart determines the way they think. The condition of our heart determines the way we think. If God is not in our heart, if he's not a priority, I'm seeing in society right now, many people believe in God, but he's not a priority. They don't care how he thinks about things. They just care what he gives them. They don't care what his plans are. They just want him to help them with their plans. I've, I've been guilty of that. Perhaps you have. Uh, God, just do this. God, just do that. Please just do this. Help this work out. Please provide this. Give me that. Take care of this. Don't let this happen. Trying to dictate to God what I want for my plans to work. But that's futile. That's, that's not going to get me where God wants me to go. As, as a parent, you know, on the, on the, the, the my, my children are all grown, they're, they're adults. It, it, it's funny, you look back on it and, and the whole time that you raise kids, you have, maybe it's, it's a, an uncommunicated goal, but you have goals in your mind for your kids. One thing that, well, why, many people say, well, I just want my kids to be happy. Well, that's ridiculous. I want my kids to be happy, but if that's all I want for my kids, I don't want very much. And I'm not a very good parent or a very good leader. Uh, the same is true with God. God wants us to have joy, but his goal for us is not just to be happy. Uh, that's why he don't just give us everything we ask for to make us happy or do everything we want so we'll be happy. God's not the kind of parent that is just up there trying to make everybody happy. So if your idea of having a God is a divine being who makes you happy, you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. You're worshiping the God of your imagination. So as a parent, though, we, we had the same goal. Maybe it was unstated. Maybe we didn't communicate it uh, clearly, but we had the same goal. Uh, one, and first and foremost, we want our kids to know the Lord, and we wanted them to grow up and, and, and follow the Lord. And we wanted them to find his will for their life, and we want, wanted them to, to live that direction and, and let him use them that way. Now, when you have multiple kids with different personalities, different attitudes, uh, different ways of communicating and responding, you have to raise them a little different. So one kid might be able to have a few more privileges than the other kid with certain things. This one, you may be able to give a little slack. You may, have, you may have to harp on this kid, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. This one, you may never have to say, do your homework. They just do it and you know it. So you have to communicate differently and you have to treat them differently and you have to put different things in, in the way and different restrictions. So when you look at it, a kid would say, that's not fair. Well, yeah, it is fair because we had the same goal in mind for the kids. The goal's the same. God's goal for us is the same. Therefore, his intervention, his work in our life is going to look different because his goal's the same for all of us. Now, if we don't know God, back to the text, it says when a person's heart is blind, they're going to be ignorant. So they're not going to understand especially divine things. They're only going to understand things from their own perspective. So you're going to interpret what people say based on what you believe and what you think. We need to know the word of God or else we will falsely interpret everything in life. When a storm comes through, that doesn't mean God is, has neglected us. You're falsely interpreting that if you don't, if you don't know God. If when a, when a virus strikes or, or, or when, the, when people blow it into something it isn't or when people are using it for selfish gain, when prophets are coming out of the woodwork with new messages, when people are fighting about racism, when, when all this nonsense and chaos is taking place, we can all back up and interpret that in, in a variety of ways. One, we could say, well, where's God in all this? Some people are doing that. Where's your God now? Uh, you, you may do that. Well, that's, that's a fault, faulty interpretation of what's going on. And the reason you're interpreting it wrong is because you don't know God. When you get to know a person, their decisions begin to make sense. When you get to know God, his intervention and what he's doing begins to make sense. All right. But if your heart is blind, if you're in the dark, then your ignorance will reign. So the only way to not be ignorant, that is to have understanding, to have, to have a, a spiritual perspective, is to, number one, you've got to have a heart that belongs to God. You and I need to all make sure that our heart belongs to God. Now, some, somebody just thought for a second, yeah, I'm glad I'm saved. Well, hold on a second. Daily, I've got to make sure right now my heart belongs to God. 
before I do what I'm fixing to do, my heart in this has to belong to God. You can't just give your heart to God and then go on and, and, and think you gave your heart to God when, whenever we're living a life when I, we put something else first. Whatever we put first reflects what our heart belongs to in that moment. If our heart belongs to, to our child in all moments, when that baby cries, we're up and at it. We're listening for the, the, the cry. We're listening for the sound. We're noticing. We're watching for needs. We're constantly checking their safety because our heart belongs to the well-being of that child. If our heart belongs to God, we're constantly listening for his voice. We're constantly thinking about what he wants to do. We're constantly aware of his presence, and we're constantly trying to adjust our schedule to be with him. That's what it looks like when our heart belongs to God. He says, if when your heart belongs to God, because of the blindness of their heart, the flip side, your heart belongs to God, then you won't be ignorant. That is, you will start to say, okay, well, what does God say about that? People make decisions that they make because of what they care about, okay? Where their heart belongs to, and what they care about determines what they learn about. And that's how they start to, to view things. I care passionately, passionately about every, human, every, every race of people, whether you're Hispanic, Black, White, uh, Native American, uh, Asian. It makes no difference, okay? Skin color is not relevant. It makes no difference. It's important right now, whoever you are, whoever I am, that I never get so focused on a social issue that I let a social issue become take a priority over a spiritual issue. When a social issue becomes more important to me than a spiritual issue, my heart in that moment doesn't belong to God and I've paused my walk with God, and I, I want God to intervene and help me with a civil issue, and God saying, wait a minute, let me handle the civil issue, you walk with me, you go vote, you do your part that way, but don't let that become your priority, don't let that become your passion, uh, whether it's politics, Republican, Democrat, whether no matter what it is, we can't give our passion to, to anything. In fact, didn't Jesus say, uh, if any man follows me, and hate not, powerful words. I was reading Oswald Chambers this week and it was one of my devotions. And hate not his mother, his father, his brother, his sister. Jesus said this, if you follow me and hate not them, then you can't be my disciple. Was he teaching us hatred? No, 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 not at all. Keep scripture with scripture. Here's what he said. When any relationship gets in the way of our relationship, you got a problem. That's what he was saying. So every relationship should be important, but Jesus even emphasized our relationship to the people that matter most to us, our own children and our own parents and our own spouse and our own siblings. He's saying that, yes, you're supposed to love each other. Yes, you're supposed to love even your enemies. But he's saying when those relationships are a civil issue, whatever it is, when that becomes a priority over your walk with me, you got problems. So the text says, their hearts are in a bad position, and what happens then is it causes ignorance. So when my heart's giving to, given to a, a civil issue, I'm ignorant to what God's trying to do in the middle of it because I'm so focused on the issue. When my heart's giving to a political idea, then I'm, I'm ignorant to what God's doing because my whole decision-making process is based on something else. So the condition of the heart determines wisdom and ignorance. He said they're walking the futility of their mind because of the blindness of their heart was the last one. That causes ignorance. And then it says it causes an alienation from the life of God. Back to verse 18. Being alienated from the life of God. Alienated is a fascinating word to use. We're all familiar with, with the word alien. That means separate from, not from here. Uh, belong somewhere else. You're, you're not participating, all right? So if I am um, an, an alien in a foreign country, I don't participate in voting. I don't have any say-so. I'm just there, okay? So the, the futility here, they're, these Gentiles that are not walking with God, they're aliens from what God's doing. They're not participating in what God's doing. That's what happens when our heart's wrong. We become ignorant, and all of a sudden, we're not participating. We're aliens. 
to the kingdom of God and his work in this world. So we no longer see what God's doing, so there's no way to participate in it. How can I possibly, how can you possibly uh, join God in, in what he's doing in the life of someone around you if you don't even know what he's doing? You're not going to be a participant. You're going to be, it's going to be alien to you. You're going to be focused on something totally different instead of focused on what God's doing. So you're going to be doing your thing, asking God why he isn't helping you do that. God, you should be participating in this. No, he's already doing something and we're supposed to be participating in that. So Paul's telling us, why do people do the things they do? And I'm going to repeat myself a lot because I want you to see the system. I want you to see the progression. I want you to see how all this ties together because it's important to grab that understanding because Paul made it a point to mention each one specifically. Therefore, each one of these must be embraced. All right, so why do people do the things they do? Because of the condition of their heart. Now, what happens with the condition of our heart? It determines whether we're wise or fool, what wise to what God's doing or foolish. It determines the direction, the course, and everything of our life. Now, what that will do, the next thing that happens is that separates us or it connects us to God. They're alienated from the life of God. The Jews wanted to tell the Gentiles, if you're going to serve God, here's what you need to do. You've got to be circumcised eighth day. You've got to offer these sacrifices. You can't eat pork, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Jews said, if you do these physical things, then uh, you'll please God. This is not about pleasing God. This is about being right with God. There's a big difference. You can do nice things for somebody and not care about them. You can try to be a servant of God and not be a child of God. God wants us in his family. He wants a relationship with us. So they're alienated. Look at the first part of verse 18, having their understanding darkened. And I've already kind of alluded to that, but here's the word for understanding. It is um, dianoia. That is the way of thinking or feeling. All right, small s, the internal part of man, the spirit of man. So they have their spirit man darkened. They have their way of thinking darkened. So if your heart's not right, you're, you're, you're blind, you're ignorant. And if you're ignorant, you're alienated. You're not participating in what God does. And the results of that is you can't even begin to comprehend what's going on other than mass confusion. So when you're confused, either you get to know God or you begin to fight for some foolish cause. You begin to push for some priority that isn't God's. You begin to live for something other than what God wants you to live for. So our decisions are based on what we're passionate about, people. Let's move down through the text a little bit. We're, we won't have much more to cover. I know that's a lot, and I know I'm doing teaching more right now, but I want you to really get this. Look at verse 19. He says, these people are past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness. Last part, I want you to see this word, with greediness. Solomon was so right when he said the love of money is the root of all evil. If you take away personal gain right now from anything going on, everybody would just drop their agenda. If, if you take away, what can this do for me? People just stop doing it. We tend to do the things that we see that benefit us. Now, what the Bible's teaching me is I need to be close to God and see the benefit in that fellowship and in that relationship. First and foremost, you need to understand, I need to understand that the most beneficial thing to us is to have a relationship with God and to walk with him daily. But their past feeling, they don't even care about that stuff. They could care less about what God wants. Past feeling means conscience seared with a hot iron. Their sins don't bother them. They don't have compassion on other people. They don't care about other people. In fact, it says they're willing to do ungodly things because of their own personal greed. Here's what happens when you don't follow God. Eventually, everybody becomes a God to themselves. Everybody begins to focus on what they want, no matter how it affects other people. You and I as Christians need to focus on what God wants because our choices and our actions affect other people. And it also determines whether or not we get a blessing or a curse. Verse 20, but you, I'll just introduce this, but you have not so learned Christ. You have not been informed 
to do those things through Christ. In fact, it's the opposite. Now, he says, you have not so learned. This is important. Why, why is it important? It's important because he used the word learn. You know what that means? Application. That means uh, responsibility. It's up to me to learn this stuff. It's up to you to learn what God wants. It's up to us to, okay, what does God want and, and how? Let me pause. Let me get you to pause your brain for a second, and I want to get you to catch up to this. Learning what God expects from us is one thing. I'm not saying it isn't important. It's one thing. The Jews thought, I need to learn what God expects from me, and I need to do it, and it'll all be okay. Wrong. Completely wrong. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. I'm going to paraphrase, obviously, again. The law taught you this, but I'm telling you this. Under the law, you're told to do this, but I'm telling you to do this. Under the law, you're told to do what God expects, but I'm telling you, you need the desire to do what God expects. Under the law, you're told your behaviors must line up, but I'm telling you that your heart needs to line up. So if we just learn what God expects and do it, we're no better off than we were before. That's what Jesus taught us. So if a society just follows laws, the society is no better off than it was before. Because at some point, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all will break those laws. We will all mess up. And we will all become a God to ourselves. He talked about that in the book of Romans when he talked about the Gentiles. So you and I can't be a God unto ourselves. That's what Satan wants. We're fighting a spiritual battle. That's where, the, that's where the battle takes place. So that's where the cure has to take place. That's where the change has to take place. He said they're past feeling. They've given themselves over to lewdness. They're willing to do things that are offensive to God. They're offensive to their own person. They're offensive to their, their own family because it doesn't matter because they want what they want so bad. They're willing to do uh, lewd and detestable things to get their way. Now, that's not the God of the Bible. That doesn't look anything like Christianity. Yeah, there are certain things we want to see fixed in society. There are certain things we want to see fixed in Congress and, and, and all over the place. There are things we want to see fixed. There are civil things we want to see changed. But you and I can't be so greedy. We can't be so determined to get those things that we fall into sin in order to make them come to pass. That's the opposite of the way God handles things. Verse... Um, 21, you've learned. you got to take it on yourself to learn what God wants. And what does God want? Well, he wants me to do this. No, we just covered that. God wants me to, here's what we got to learn. We learned that all of this is fixed by our hearts getting right. How do our hearts get right? First and foremost, by coming out of darkness. Because the, 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 what it, the way it affected them, they lived a futile life because first and foremost, their hearts were dark. Their hearts were sick. They were blind. They couldn't see. They were so focused on what they want, they couldn't even see what God wanted. Here's, a, here's something to think about. When Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery, that had to be one of the most deep, lonely, dark, depressing days that anybody's ever lived. I mean, obviously we could talk about Job and, and some of the other things, but for this young man to completely lose his his family, his relationship with his dad, to be betrayed by his own brothers. Now the life that he, he thought as a young man he was going to have growing up, it was gone. Now he was not only alone, he went from being nurtured and loved on and cuddled by dad. Now he was just kind of tossed out there. Now he was all alone in a foreign land, forced to, to become a slave. And one thing happened to Joseph after another. Now, Joseph could have said, what have I done, God? Fix this. I, I want to fix this. And he could have went on a, a, a major campaign to fix injustice, but he didn't go on a campaign to fix injustice. Instead, he grew closer to God. And as he grew closer to God, what happened? Not only did he begin to see God at work in his life, but he began to experience God at work in his life. God brought the change that needed to be changed. We need to trust God to bring the change. We don't need to try to force the change. God's going to bring the change his way. 
We need to trust God to bring the change. And the only way we will let God do that is if we get out of his way. And the way we get out of his way is to focus on our own individual walk and our, get our hearts right with God and come out of darkness. He said, you've not so learned. That's mine. That's your responsibility. Verse 22, I'll speed this up. We're just about done. He said that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Last two things I want to talk about. Verse 22. The old man grows corrupt. Grows corrupt. See those words? The old man grows in his Corruption. Corruption does not stay at, at a, a complacent level. It gets worse because the more we fight for our way, we're going to face opposition. We're not a God. We can't bring our will to pass. So we're going to have opposition. So we're going to have to get more, more selfish. We're going to have to get more corrupt. We're going to have to sacrifice more things to get our agenda, to push our ideas through. We're going to get more corrupt. We're going to get more corrupt. Here's the bottom line. Sin gets worse, not better. Sin don't fix itself. Only God can fix people. So he says that we put off, that put this stuff off. Start there and say, God, here I am today. I'm putting off my own selfish ways, my corruption. I want out of darkness. Then he said in verse 23, the last point, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I told you a few minutes ago that Jesus talked about it. The change takes place on the inside. It does not take place with a list of rules. God's way of fixing this is from the inside of people, all right? And people are ignorant. You and I are still ignorant of some things. We don't know everything about God. We don't know everything God wants us to do. We don't know everything about ourselves that he's trying to show us. But don't become complacent and say, okay, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I've got it. I, I'm good. Now let me just see what God wants and let me go around and fuss at people and tell them to start acting godly. Wrong. It's not our job. He's telling us that I need to not put a new man on you. I don't need to chase people around and say, here, dress righteous, act straight, behave better. He's saying, I need to put him on me. I'm responsible for me. In fact, listen to this. If the Lord came back 15 minutes from now, the world's going to still look just like it did. In fact, it'll get worse. But the problems that you live to fix will still exist. But you're going to face God. It's time. It's time for you and God to say, all right, let's talk about what you did with your life. Well, I brought, I, I brought social justice. Well, well, I, I, I reformed government. Well, I, I, I fixed the, the budget. Well, I fixed uh, international trade. Well, I took care of uh, local laws on whether I should have to wear a corona mask. I fought for this. How much of that matters? How much of that really matters? What matters is what God tells me to do about me. And what he tells you to do about you, because the way that he uses us is not to run around and police the world. The way he uses us is by his spirit producing fruit through our lives. And the fruit of that spirit brings change, not our arguing, not our debating, not our fussing. He said, Brian, focus on these things. Put on the new man. Do you know why? If you'll put on the new man back to where we started and then I'll close. If you'll put on the new man, then your heart will be in the right place. You're not going to be walking in darkness anymore. And when you do that, you're not going to be ignorant. You're going to begin to see what God is doing. And I'm reversing verse 18. And then when that happens, you're not going to be an alien to the work of God. You're going to suddenly become a blessing because the fruit of God is going to shine through your life. And when that happens, you're going to understand the purpose. You're going to understand the power. You're going to understand the presence of God. Furthermore, you're going to be making decisions that are not vain. Verse 17, you're not going to be living in the futility of your mind. You're going to be living a life that you were intended to live, that God wants you to live, that has a purpose, that brings change, and that God can touch the world through. The end of Joseph's life, you know how it happened, right? After all of that, Joseph, um, his brothers had to come back and meet him face to face. You know, at some point, the people that we argue with God's going to probably give us an opportunity to be alone with them. What's that going to look like? What if he does give us that chance? What's that going to look like? What are we going to say? Well, I won that argument. At some point, we're going to be accountable just to put issues aside and be person to person because at the end of the day, it's people. 
you're a person and I'm a person. Our ideas are tossed. On Judgment Day, all ideas, all philosophies, all theories are out the window. It's just me and God. And it's just, how did I affect your life for the kingdom of God? How did you affect your neighbors for the kingdom of God? At the end of the day, that's it. That's what matters. So Joseph could have said, all right, it's vengeance. I'm fixing everything that's been wrong. I'm fixing it. And that was his chance to do it. He had the power to do it. He could have made slaves out of people that sold him to be a slave. But he didn't do it. He had a chance to do it, but he didn't do it because his goal had nothing to do with that. Our goal should have nothing to do with that. In fact, Joseph's eyes were on God. How much of his life, how many nights did Joseph probably cry himself to sleep, weep for his own dad, not knowing if he was dead or alive? How many, how many nights was he lonely? No telling. But when he got to the end of his life, you know what was important? He had lived the life that God wanted him to live. He trusted that God was involved in it. He believed that God was going to use him, and God did. And right now, all that matters because Joseph's in the presence of the Lord, and I know for a fact the Lord was able to look at Joseph and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Folks, that's what we need to do. Don't live in the futility of our minds. Don't live in the vanity of our minds. Why do people make the decisions they make? Because what they care about is what their heart belongs to, and what their heart belongs to determines the way they think, and the way they think determines the kind of choices they make. Let's not live vain lives. Let's live a good purpose. Let's live for the glory of the kingdom of God. I love all of you. I pray that this helps you. I pray we can take this and apply it to our own lives, share it with somebody else, encourage others to listen. And I look forward to seeing each one of you. We will be back on as of now. Wednesday will still be online. We won't meet yet. We'll meet as soon as possible. If something changes quicker, we'll let you know and we'll have the sanctuary available. But we will always, from here on out, our plans are to always make messages available like this. I love all of you. Have a blessed day.